Okay. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you all for joining. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to introduce today's speaker, Vasiliki Pavlidou. She is an associate professor at the Department of Physics at the University of Crete. Uh, so she did her PhD uh, at the University of Illinois, so at Urbana-Champaign, and her postdoctoral work at the University of Chicago and at Caltech. Uh, she spent a year at Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn before moving to Crete in 2012. Uh, she works on high energy astrophysics and cosmology. Um, so um, thank you, Vasha, so much for being here. I'm uh, very happy to hear more about your recent work, and I'm sure that everybody else is too. So um, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra, for uh, the kind introduction and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be talking to all of you today. And um, since these are uh, peculiar times still, although we are turning uh, to some semblance of normalcy, um, I have decided to start uh, with a non-traditional approach. Now that I still have everybody's attention, I will start with my recap of my talk. So, um, Let's just assume we have a galaxy cluster, okay? And around that galaxy cluster, we have the expanding universe. And at some point, you still have matter infalling on that galaxy cluster, big structure still accreting matter um, onto it. And of course, there will be a boundary between infall and expansion, and that's the turnaround radius. So this is where I will focus today. And the first thing I will try to convince you about is that the average matter density within the turnaround radius of a cluster is universal. It is the same for all clusters at a given redshift and for a given cosmology. But it does, however, depend on Z and on cosmology. And this is true both in spherical collapse and for realistic simulated clusters. Okay. And for that reason, the turnaround density can be used as a cosmological probe. Okay, you measure it for a bunch of clusters, and then as a function of redshift, it can tell you the cosmology that you live in. And as a cosmological probe, it has some unique virtues. I will show you that it is very sensitive to the cosmological constant or dark energy. Um, it is a local probe which means it can measure lambda or dark energy today and not an average value over the history of the universe. And it can detect the presence of dark energy on a cluster scale rather than its effect on the universe as a whole. And for that reason, we should go ahead and observe it. So this is my talk. So the one message I would like uh, to leave you with today is that Turnaround density probes cosmology. So having gotten that out of the way, we can now go back and do things more um, traditionally. So I would like to start by introducing the team. Lots of people from Crete are working with, and we have one uh, who's actually one in uh, one of you now, uh, Chicagoland inhabitant. Uh, Dimitrios Anoglidis, so he's um, a graduate, but I would like to give a shout out to two very important people on this list. Uh, Yorgos Kokidis, uh, the hardworking PhD student, who actually might be visiting uh, Chicagoland very soon. Uh, he might very well be there at the beginning of next year, so keep an eye out on him. Uh, he can tell you all um, things about turnaround uh, cosmology. And the second one uh, is our high energy partner in crime, Theodore Tomaras, who has been there uh, since the beginning um, uh, when we started working on um, turnaround cosmology and whom we tragically lost um, a couple of months ago. Uh, he's um, sorely missed every day. So with that note, uh, let me fulfill my contractual obligation to flash you with uh, the people that pay the bills. And uh, let's, let's return to our main message here. Turn around density probes cosmology. So I will tell you this story in four parts. First of all, I will again tell you what 
I mean by turnaround density, and I will even show you um, an equation to make it real. Um, and then we'll ask, okay, so what about that turnaround density? What is it that makes it probe cosmology? And first we will seek insight from a spherical cow. So the spherical collapse model, which is our uh, workhorse uh, for making good guesses about what might be interesting to look at um, in more detail. But of course, uh, when all is said and done, the cow does have limbs and stuff. So we will then take a look at what um, the turnaround density looks like in realistic structures. And after I hopefully convince you that in realistic structures as well, turnaround density probes cosmology, um, we will ask ourselves, do we really need a new probe? So what's really good about turnaround density as a cosmological probe, don't, don't we already have enough? And I will close with an epilogue about observability. Okay, so without any further ado, part one, what is the turnaround density? So let me start again. I have a galaxy cluster and around it the expansion of uh, the expanded universe. Well, go far enough, I know you have Hubble flow, but if you don't go far enough close to the cluster, you still have material that is infalling onto the cluster and the boundary between them, which is the turnaround scale. Now, when I'm talking about turnaround density, I mean the mean matter density, the average matter density within the turnaround sphere. So I will take all of the mass enclosed by the turnaround sphere and I will divide by the volume of the turnaround sphere. I am not referring to the local density of the turnaround shell, okay? I am referring to the mean matter density within the entire sphere. And it is that density that probes cosmology. And now my job is to tell you why. So that brings us to part two, insights about uh, the turnaround density from a spherical care, that one. So let's go and think about the spherical collapse model. So what about the turnaround density? Um, let's uh, first focus on the property uh, that I claimed in the beginning that it is universal. Um, that is very easy to see in a cosmology that we don't really believe anymore at all. So the spherical collapse model is really easy to write down um, you know, in a cosmology that philosophically we, we, we cling on to for a very long time. Even I am old enough to remember where we couldn't give up on it so easily. Uh, and of course, uh, the equations uh, can, can, can be solved very beautifully. Uh, if, if you want to follow the, um, the evolution of a, of a, of a shell uh, around a, um, a collapsed structure, that will just be written as a parametric equation for its radius and the time. And of course, in that case, turnaround is you know, completely obvious. When it happens, it happens for this theta equals pi. Uh, the turnaround radius is 2a. The turnaround time is... Uh, b pi, and then very easily you can work out in two lines that the turnaround density, so the density inside that turnaround shell, mean matter density, is 5.55 times the mean matter density of the universe at the time where you're making your observation. And it is clearly universal. It doesn't care about whether in there there is a collapsed cluster and how big it is, right? As long as this shell is turning around, the density inside is 5.55 times the mean density um, of the universe. Actually, this fact is where uh, the magical number 178, 18 pi square comes from, uh, which is what gave us the famous R200, you know, the, the virial radius of the cluster being about 200 times the mean matter density of the universe. It's, 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 this is the same universality that this, is come, this comes from um, at its heart. Okay, so let me show you this in a plot, okay, because equations are ugly. So what I'm showing here is on the x-axis, I have plotted the logarithm of the scale factor. So zero is 
today. And one is when the universe is 10 times as big and minus one is when the universe was 10 times as small. So time now moves to the right. And on the y-axis, I have plotted the logarithm of the turnaround density in units of the critical density today. So basically it's the logarithm of omega turnaround, if you wish. And of course, in standard CDM cosmology, in an omega matter equals one flat universe, um, as we saw, this evolves, the turnaround density evolves proportionally to rho matter or proportionally to the scale factor of the minus three. So it is this nice straight line in the log log plot. But of course, uh, one would hope I'm not here to talk to you about standard CDM cosmology. Uh, we can do this exercise for other cosmologies as well. And of course, the result is not the same, but it is calculable. It's not the pretty parametric equations anymore, but it is definitely a calculable result. And we have calculated, and this is what it looks like. This is what happens for concordance lambda CDM cosmology. Okay? So early on, the universe doesn't know. It lives in lambda CDM. It's lambda CDM. It thinks it's matter dominated. So of course, uh, omega turnaround falls as it would in a matter dominated universe. It falls as um, the scale factor to the minus three. But notice what happens at very late times. At very late times, of course, if you have dark energy, structure formation halts. And this is also reflected in the turnaround density in the way that the turnaround density becomes equal to twice rho lambda. Okay? So that, of course, is proportional to uh, the scale factor to the zero. Okay. Now, clearly, this gives us a very nice way to, um, to probe cosmology, because, you know, if you wait until the universe is, oh, I don't know, twice as big, you know, that logarithm of A becomes you know, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.5, you're already entering that, that, that flat part, and you can actually measure the turnaround density, and that will tell you all that. The problem with this line of arguments is that I have found very hard to keep the attention of funding agencies for five years or 10 years, you know, the duration of a decadal survey, much less for a few billions of years. So it, it won't fly. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another, another way. Okay. And this is what it looks like for an open CDM universe. Okay. So mega matter is 0.3, uh, but there is no lambda. So early on again, uh, the turnaround density falls as the scale factor to the minus three. And at late times, it becomes proportional to your curvature. So it falls like the scale factor to the minus two. So you can see a pattern here. At any given time and in any given cosmology, the turnaround density tends to follow the dominant component of the universe. Okay? And that's how it depends on cosmology. Now, the way this looks with these thick lines and the y-axis being logarithmic, I know it doesn't look very promising because around zero, if you look at it, it, it looks more or less the same for all cosmologies. And still I'm here arguing that the turnaround density is a great cosmological probe. So what gives? Let me, let me show you the same plot, but uh, without the thick lines. Uh, which is for the benefit of the presentation, but the way we put it in the paper. Um, can you see my cursor? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So if you go to today, which is uh, the logarithm of the scale factor being zero, okay, right here, and you look at the slope, the slope of the turnaround density as a function of scale factor today, in concordance cosmology. So what, if, if, if we don't go and ask the universe, but if we ask our model, what should this derivative be? What should this slope be? The answer is that right now, the turnaround density falls as the scale factor of the minus 1.5. Now, 
Now, this is very interesting because in any cosmology without any lambda, you can never achieve any slope that is shallower than minus two at best. Minus three if omega matter equals one, minus two if omega matter is smaller than one, and then you have entered curvature domination. So if I go out and observe a slope that is more shallow than minus two, as it is that I expect today, then I for sure know that lambda exists in the universe. And this is where its sensitivity of the turnaround density uh, to lambda uh, stems from. Now, still with these logarithms and this looking into the future, that does not make a very strong argument about um, something that you would go out and observe. So let me show you um, the observer's plot. Okay, so now I have lost the logarithm on the y-axis. I'm just showing you omega turnaround, the uh, turnaround density in units of the critical density today. And on the x-axis, I'm showing redshift. So now time runs to the left, and I'm looking into the past, which I am allowed to do. Yeah, I cannot look into the future, but I can look into the past. So here is what happens. Um, standard CDM in the value that I expect for this omega turnaround today uh, differs significantly from open CDM and lambda CDM. And the reason is that because the value of the turnaround density today basically mostly props the value of omega matter today. Okay, These two sets of cosmologies, standard CDM and then everything that has omega matter equals 0.3, um, will have a different um, value of omega turnaround today. Now, the interesting thing is that even if you fix omega matter and in turn omega turnaround today, these curves, if lambda is there at the quantity we believe it is, and if it's not, deviate very, very fast from each other, okay? And just to quantify this fast, I'm showing you here with the uh, magenta squiggle, the kind of constraint that you can place if you measure a hundred clusters at redshift 0.3, not very well. So with an uncertainty of say 50% in road turnaround in each. So hopefully now that um, intrigues you enough. Uh, to start believing me that that might be interesting as a cosmological probe. So what would a constraint look like uh, based on raw turnaround in the omega matter, omega lambda plot that is the uh, fundamental pillar of the concordance model? Uh, as promised, uh, the measurement of raw turnaround today at redshift zero, basically probes omega matter. It is this red, uh, red band here, and I'm no longer showing a hundred clusters because if you're, you know, if you're making a hypothetical measurement, you might just go ahead and measure, you know, a significant portion of the clusters that are out there to be measured. So this is more like forty thousand clusters now. Okay, that's why this looks so nice and tight. But if we do measure 40,000 clusters, then this is the kind of constraint we can place um, on omega matter. And then the derivative of uh, rotor around with, with uh, redshift is going to place this um, nice horizontal purple band as a constraint on omega lambda alone. Okay, so no, well, it's it's, it's not not competitive with the other measures. Let's put it like that. And if you combine the two, it looks something like that. So one advantage it has is that it can give you both omega matter and omega lambda. It's not a line um, on that plot. It's 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 more of a uh, blob. Okay. 
So that's what I wanted to show you from the spherical collapse model. And hopefully um, it's now, um, you know, share my enthusiasm that turn around density probes cosmology, uh, or at least it does so if clusters are nice spherical creatures um, that do what the spherical collapse model says they should be doing. But of course, at this point, you should already be uh, protesting that uh, the cow has limbs and stuff, head, tail. Uh, so you might worry you know, in a realistic cluster, which looks nothing like a sphere. A realistic cluster looks like an octopus. You cannot even define meaningfully a single turnaround radius. Maybe every particle has its own turnaround radius and other such colorful protests is the things that we said to ourselves when we looked at this result first. So the thing to do next is to go to realistic structures, simulated clusters and cosmological simulations and, uh, and take a look at how the turnaround radius and density behave there. So that's what we're going to do next. And let's ask the difficult questions. Okay, let's not be kind. So the first question to ask is, does a kinematically meaningful turnaround scale even exist in realistic clusters? Okay, does it even make sense to speak about a turnaround radius in a realistic cluster? All right, so first things first, you can certainly always define a turnaround radius. And there is a recipe for doing so. You know, I will just keep my cartoon of the spherical cluster here to remind ourselves what we're talking about. All right, so let me show you a plot for a simulated cluster. That's, um, that's a cluster from, um, I think it is uh, one of the illustrious TNG 300 clusters. It's about six times 10 to the 14 solar masses in mass. Um, and that's pretty much typical behavior. What I'm showing you here is a radial velocity profile. So um, we have shells of radius R that I'm showing in the X axis. And within each shell, we are calculating an average radial velocity okay? with, with respect to the center of the cluster. And while you are at the central, sort of relaxed part of the cluster, this will move around zero. And then you have negative velocities because this is accretion. And then eventually you have the Hubble flow. So if you start from the expanding parts, if you start from the outermost uh, outgoing galaxies, particles, and then you move inwards, you will eventually cross zero. And you can always say, okay, this is the turnaround radius, the kinematically defined turnaround radius for this cluster. Now, of course, that does not guarantee that this is in any way meaningful. For example, here at the central parts of the cluster, I also have an average radial velocity that is zero, but I know that these particles have very large range of radial velocities that are not zero. Okay? It's just the average that is zero. So it might very well be that the, within the turnaround shell, I have a huge spread of velocities as well. So it's completely meaningless um, to define a single shell for the entire very non-spherical cluster. So we thought we would also plot the velocity dispersion in the turnaround shell. Okay. So here I'm plotting VR square, the radial velocity square in units of the circular velocity at uh, R200, also squared as a function of radius. And here now you can see that at the central parts of the cluster where before I had also zero average radial velocity. Here I have a very large dispersion. It makes sense, right? This is, the, this is the relaxed part of the cluster. It's moving around a lot. It's just on average, not going anywhere. But on the turnaround shell, look at that. The dispersion is minimal. It's tiny. It's very, very small. So really, 
within this shell, within the turnaround shell, the particles are meaningfully slowing down all of them. You can get away with defining a single turnaround shell. It, 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 it makes sense kinematically for the cluster. And I, I, I want to support this argument because seeing is believing by showing you a, a cluster in projection. It's the same cluster I've been showing in the other two plots. Um, here it is. So on the left, you see uh, a projection of the number of particles in that cluster. And you can see really it's an octopus. I don't know if it has um, eight tentacles, but it has several. And with the red circle, you can see the uh, turnaround radius. And with the black circle, you can see R200. And on the left, you cannot see the turnaround radius by eye. Nothing happens where, where I have drawn the, the red circle. Now look at the right-hand plot. Here I have the average radial velocity. Okay, so average in every, if you, if you want, cylinder yeah, that we see. And it can be um, either negative if it's bluish or positive if it's reddish. And you can see here is the uh, outgoing part, the, the expanding universe, the Hubble flow. And in here, you have things like relaxed parts, some going out, some going in. If I had to guess, I would say around here is a splashback radius. And then if somebody pointed you know, a gun to your head and asked you, okay, here, where do you see the turnaround radius? I'm going to argue you would in fact draw the red line, right? You can see where blue separates from red when you go from outwards to inwards, and you can see it becoming whitish around that region. So really the entire shell slowing down. The turnaround radius exists, the turnaround shell exists. Okay. All right, so in the question, does a kinematically meaningful turnaround scale exist in realistic clusters? I'm going to count that as a yes, but that's not enough. Okay, that's not enough. We also need to show that in that now kinematically defined shell in that kinematically defined sphere inside the average density is universal. That's the other statement we're making and which hopefully is um, showing us that we can use this as a cosmological probe. So is the average density within the turnaround radius universal? What would this look like? Well, I could plot the turnaround mass, so the total mass included within the turnaround radius, and the turnaround radius against each other. And if all goes well, the turnaround radius should grow as the turnaround mass to the one third. Or if you prefer, if the universal density exists, the turnaround mass should grow as our turnaround to the cube, okay? Universal density. So let's, let's take a look at some clusters. So I'm going to show you, again, clusters from Illustris uh, Next Generation and the Dark, the dark Sky um, simulations. Here they are. Between 10 to the 14, 10 to the 16 solar masses in turnaround mass. Okay, so a few times 10 to the 15 for uh, M200, if you prefer. And the... Red line here is a line that has a slope of one third. Okay, so that the existence, the, 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 the clustering of these points that had their radius and the enclosed mass measured kinematically, right? That's the kinematically determined uh, turnaround radius. They cluster around this line with slope uh, one third. And so an, a universal average and close density really exists. Now, the more impressive part is that actually the red line is the spherical collapse prediction. 
So not only a universal turnaround density exists, but it is exactly what you would think um, if you had applied spherical collapse, the cosmological parameters of these two simulations. So is the average density within the turnaround radius universal in realistic clusters? Um, I'm going to say that the answer to that is yes. And consistent with the spherical cow predictions. And finally, for some you know, fresh results um, about to be submitted very, very soon, thanks to the very hard work by Yorvos, does the turnaround density probe cosmology in simulations, right? Because up to now, I showed you that it all goes well for lambda CDM cosmology at redshift Z. Okay? The question is how well, and can I use it to probe cosmology? Okay, so this is what this looks like. I'm showing you omega turnaround as a function of redshift. And the solid lines are three spherical collapse model predictions, standard CDM, open CDM, and lambda CDM, open CDM with omega matter 0.3, lambda CDM 0.3.7. Okay. And then the points, the points are what we get from simulations. And these are actually very old simulations. These are the Virgo simulations because gravity doesn't get old, right? It doesn't get stale. So we thought, you know, that's, that's a set of simulations freely available for use and tested for a very long time, already produced lots of good science. Let's see if we can recover these cosmologies um, from the turnaround density uh, of the clusters. And it turns out the answer is yes. You have to be a little bit careful and apply some quality cuts. Your clusters shouldn't be, they should be massive enough and they shouldn't be too um, preterved by neighbors. So the distribution of neighbors, neighbors are okay. You know, everybody has neighbors, but they shouldn't have very aspherical distribution. Then, then things start to get bad. But we have shown, we have, we have worried about this and we have shown that uh, you can determine that on projection on the sky. So you can reject clusters that don't come from good families, and you're still left with lots of clusters that will give you basically that beautiful result um, that you're seeing here. So realistic clusters, simulated clusters, clusters in n-body cosmological simulations um, do uh, indeed, uh, can indeed be used as cosmological probes through their turnaround. Okay. So does the turnaround density probe cosmology and simulations? The answer to that is also yes. So I think that what we're finding in simulations also is that turnaround density probes cosmology. Which brings me to part four. If you have believed everything I have said to you up to now, do we really need another probe? No, I, I think uh, Jorvos was giving um, that talk at some point. And the question he got is, but we already know Lambda exists. <laughs> so why are you so worried about this? So we, we compiled the list of reasons why we're um, so excited. I shouldn't say why, why are we so excited about this? Which I call the six virtues of the turnaround density as a cosmological probe. All right, so virtue number one, obviously different systematics. So no supernova physics. You can point, you know, you can make a different line. Actually, it's not even a line, it's a blob on the omega matter, omega lambda plot, which has a different slope and completely different systematics than all the other uh, probes. It probes lambda and you don't have to understand how supernovae works. It is a cluster scale probe, right? Because if you forget about um, everything else. You know, forget about clusters altogether. How do we know that lambda is there? Okay. We know because of its effect on the expansion rate of the universe, and that is a completely global probe, a supernovae. And we know because there is not enough matter uh, in the universe to make it flat, but the CMB tells us the universe is flat. So because of its effect on the geometry of the universe, and this is also a completely global problem. We know that lambda is there because it affects the universe as a whole. But here is now a probe that can tell us, look, around this cluster, 
within these 10 megaparsecs, there has to be lambda. It's doing something to that cluster over there. And that is very interesting on its own. But what's more, remember about that slope, D rho turnaround DZ, that you measure it today, or okay, not today, you cannot really measure it just with measurements at redshift zero, but just with measurements at low redshift, you don't have to go to redshift one, right? You can see how clusters at redshift zero behave differently from clusters at redshift point three. So you are detecting lambda between zero and 0 0.3. And then you can make another measurement by comparing that derivative between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 or one. And you can check if that's the same lambda or that's a different, if that's an evolving dark energy. So that's also very useful in itself. The fourth virtue is that it's using clusters. Clusters are just sitting there to be measured. They're not transient sources that you have to you know, go out and chase. You know, this is just good sitting duck targets. And it's not like I'm speaking heresy. We are observing these clusters anyhow. I'm just suggesting we observe them you know, into larger scales, definitely, okay, much further out than what the V and radius is much further out than where the splashback radius is further out, okay? at the turnaround scale, where the Hubble flow starts. And then you can get much more information out of that. But you know, the same service that give you all the other properties of clusters is the same service that will give you the turnaround density. And finally, the turnaround density is universal. Okay? At the given redshift, you're trying to measure that one number, which means you have zero concerns about the completeness of your sample. You are allowed to make all sorts of quality cuts that you wish. You can select the clusters that are the most spherical, the most lonely, the most pretty. As we say in Crete, the clusters that come from a good family with lots of olive tree roots. Okay, so you can choose the good ones as long as the only cut you're not allowed to make is the clusters that give you the turnaround density that you want. That is not allowed, but anything else based on the quality of your data or the distribution of galaxies around that cluster with a uniform uh, algorithm, then you can place these cuts and reduce any biases after calibrating with simulations. So it's, it's the advantage of measuring a universal number. So for all these reasons, not only does turnaround density probe cosmology, but it probes it in new and interesting ways. So we should go out and observe it. So I am going to uh, close somewhere here. And I just want to say a few words about observability. I'm not going to show you any plots. This is what we're working on uh, next. Uh, this is where we're putting all of our effort. Um, what I want to say is observing the turnaround radius is not a new idea. Actually, for the local universe, the very nearby clusters, the, um, this, is, this has been done for quite some time now. So it's, it's rather, it, it's not easy, but it's straightforward what you have to do. The advantage in the very local universe is that you can have for each galaxy uh, some measure of its distance that's independent of redshift. And then you know which galaxy is in front, which galaxy is behind. You have spectroscopic redshifts for all these galaxies. This is a doable measurement. So in principle, all of the information is there. But um, with the ways we have been using up to now to observe the turnaround radius, which is the first step in observing the turnaround density, um, it is very expensive. Okay. So what we are working on right now, and we're hoping to have um, good results, it's looking good, it's not looking hopeless, is how we can make this endeavor um, cheap and whether we can demonstrate that this is doable with, um, with already existing data. All right, 
So I'm going to just put up my recap slide and uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you. It was really um, interesting. Um, so do people have questions or comments? Uh, yeah, Josh, go ahead. Hi, yeah, very interesting talk. Um, I guess, can you, can you say a bit more about observability? That seems to be the key factor. Um, what kind of, obs uh, so I assume you need spectroscopic observations uh out to large scales per cluster um and you have a sense uh from simulations of you know what what kind of errors you can get on turnaround radius turnaround density cosmological parameters yes so i i, I definitely have real numbers for the local universe but these are not scalable right you cannot do a redshift 0.3, what you can do at redshift zero. So at redshift zero, people have achieved 10% you know, error in the measurement of the turnaround radius, which is fantastic. You know, as, as I said, you have lots of classes. If you could do something like that uh, for 100 clusters, right? Um, it's, um, you, you can just do very well. Uh, I'm assuming you won't be able to do that. Um, because what you don't have once you go outside your neighborhood is independent measurements of distance for a bunch of galaxies, which is what the main industry has been uh, up to now. Um, you know, if, if you wait for a supernova, supernova to blow up in each of the 200, 300, 400 galaxies you need to measure the turnaround radius, you know, you can also wait, you know, a few billion years to um, uh, just measure directly, directly your lambda. The other thing that you can do is measure, try to measure um, the turnaround radius on the plane of the sky, right? Because the, the, the individual distances you need if you're trying to measure in, in the line of sight, you know, front to back. You can try to measure the left to the right. And there you have to measure uh, the most forward way, you know, if you want to do it kinematically, is to measure the, uh, how the dispersion of velocities changes as you go away from the center. And there, yes, because you're trying to measure a dispersion, it would be very nice if you had spectroscopic measurements. If you do have spectroscopy, you know, in, 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 the, in the limit where I'm allowed to use you know, all resources of humankind to do nothing else but that, um, then yes, you can, you can achieve that 10% uh, at, at range of 0.3. Uh, but as I said, the trick is, um, and what we're working really hard on right now is if you can do it more um, cheaply. So, but, but definitely the information is there uh, to get. Uh, it, it can be obtained to the accuracy you wish. And because you have a lot of clusters, you don't need outrageous accuracy. Even the 10%, you, you can live with 20%. You can live with 25% error uh, in, the, in the turnaround radius. It's not the end of the world. You, you have large numbers working for you. Um, but um, yes, if you could do it more cheaply, uh, that would be ideal. But it can be done with observable quantities alone. Uh, let's put it like that. And then the mass. Um, yeah. And what about the masses? You would get that from weak lensing or X-ray or Sonia Zadovich or. Yes, all of these are good. Any uh, actually X-rays would be the best. Uh, the problem is they 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 don't go out uh, enough. But then neither does lensing. So you will have. You, you won't measure the mass all the way out to the turnaround radius, you will have to assume some scaling. So um, to put it simply, it, it would have to be a, in the particle physics world, the particle astrophysics world, we'll call it a forward measurement, right? You, you make some assumptions about your cosmology and everything, and then self-consistently you, you, you calculate the scaling of the mass where you can measure it out to the turnaround uh, radius, and then you actually measure the turnaround radius, you, um, you put all of it inside the concoction, and if all goes well, you get an evolution with redshift, which is the same as the cosmology you put in, and if you don't, you get burned. Thanks.
Okay, uh, Arka. Hi, well, so thanks for the talk. And I think Josh asked both questions I had in mind, but uh, yeah, on the second one, yeah, it's, you know, if, you, if you're estimating the turnaround radius just from galaxies, then you have to worry about, you know, the bias and everything and whether they're actually tracing the density or some biased version of the density. But I guess uh, the plan you outline makes sense, like you forward model it and then try to see if it's consistent. Um, the other question I had uh, was the following. So uh, why, you, you mentioned that in the local universe, if you have a supernova measurement that helps you, can you sort of explain why that helps you? Uh, sorry, yes. In the local universe, you don't need supernova measurements. That's, that's what I meant. You can have distances uh, for individual galaxies, you know, in, in the very nearby clusters, you can have cities, you can have Tally Fisher, you can have, you know, you, you can have measures of how far away they are that are not based on the redshift, right? And I then see, what you're trying to do is determine which galaxies are in front of the cluster center and which galaxies are behind the cluster center. Mm -hmm. And then you see which cross zero with respect to radial velocity uh, with, um, as measured as a function of the cluster center. And then you can measure the turnaround range. It's a measurement done in the line of sight. That's why it is. Well. OK, got it. Thanks. Okay, any other questions or comments? You can either raise hand or yeah, just unmute and ask. Okay. Press escape here. Uh, what I want to do is oh, very good. Um, so I guess I uh, was wondering um, so on the simulations that uh you were using i think you said virgo um how many like different cosmologies you have inside like maybe maybe if we were to like leverage newer um simulations with a lot of different cosmologies maybe we could somehow you know maybe learn from that and make methods that uh can um use cheaper uh, observations so just regular uh, visible absolutely we are, you're absolutely correct and this is what we're working on right now full steam oh, perfect yes, the answer is yes <laughs> the answer is yes and you know if, if you figure a method that works in one cosmology you know, you know one big box you, know, you, you don't need to run a thousand cosmologies to just see something that's maybe hopeful but then in order to calibrate and use it in the real world, if you want to do something like contours on the mega mother, mega lambda plot, then you would have, especially for the forward modeling, as we were discussing with uh, Jos and Orca, that then you would most definitely need to run a whole bunch of cosmologies. And it's really good that you can do this uh, nowadays relatively fast. Computers are great. No. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, cool, uh, thanks. Uh, Albert, you can also ask. Hi, th thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering if there's something you can do with stacking. I mean, because like weak lensing, you know, the signal would be weak out there, but you can stack things. Um, have you thought about that? That is a fantastic idea. You can definitely stack. Uh, ideally, you would want something like um, stack structures um, that have a similar M200. It does not directly, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of, um, of scatter in the scaling of M200 with M turnaround, but still it would be the best way to reduce noise. And then because you're measuring a universal quantity, uh, that would work actually really well. That's a really good idea, yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank question one more time. Thank you so much. This was amazing and fun. <laughs> um,
And yeah, so thank you. Thank you uh, to all of you for coming and I will see you all next week. Bye everyone. Thank you everybody.